Dear President Poimans, dear President Maas, members of the parliament and people of Ypres, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. One and a half years ago, on Martin, March 15th, 2011, I arrived here in Brussels to start my new job as the director of Carnegie Europe, the Brussels, the Europe wing of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And about six weeks after I arrived here, I took my entire team and I brought them up to Ypres for a team retreat and um, for discussions on what our agenda would be over the next few years, what our strategy would be, and where we wanted to bring Carnegie Europe as an organization. So the workshop was the official agenda, but I had a different agenda in mind when I brought my young staff over there. My real agenda was to show them why Andrew Carnegie, the man who still pays for most of what we do, even though he's dead for 100 years, was so obsessed about peace and why he spent fantastic amounts of money on good causes to fight the evil of war. I wanted to, them to see what Carnegie feared most when he set up the organization that we worked in and uh, dedicated it to ending war and armed conflict. I wanted them to see the endless row, rows of graves of young men who had been busy killing each other before they actually got killed themselves. And I wanted them to understand why we as an organization existed and what it actually was that we were working for so that whenever they had a difficult phone call to make or a nasty chore to fulfill or something boring uh, to finish that they knew that they were doing it for something bigger than just a thing itself. And so we went um, to Ypres to see what was at stake and I wanted them also to see you know, what could happen if we failed with our work. And maybe that sounds like a bit too much pathos and a bit too much of a high-minded kind of language here, but I think it really wasn't too much. I think it can't hurt sometimes to provide a bigger, a much bigger picture as the backdrop to, which, to the things that we're actually doing on a daily basis, especially when your own organization claims to work for nothing less than peace, peace itself, which is a pretty big claim to make. So to sum it all up, I went to Ypres because I wanted my Irish and French and Filipina and Ukrainian, my Turk, my Italian, the American and the German on my staff to see the DNA of Carnegie Europe. Because the DNA of Carnegie Europe lies in Flanders fields. It lies in Ypres. I want to tell you another brief Ypres story here tonight. For the last few years, I've been part of a group of friends five friends, Catholics and Protestant. Um, and uh, every year for the last few years, we've, we've been meeting once a year for a weekend um, to walk and to talk and to debate issues of politics and faith. And every year we would go to a different place and every year we would choose a different motto for the kind of exercitium that we were doing. And this year it was Versöhnung und Vergebung, reconciliation and forgiveness and as the location for this year's weekend, and you might guess, we chose Ypres as the place for it. And so this September, we traveled to Flanders and visited the museum and prayed in St. Martin's Cathedral and in St. George's Memorial Church, and we talked about the legacy of the Great War and how love can be inserted back into a situation of hatred, how people can forgive, not forget, live with each other, and start to trust each other again. And all of that, of course, interspersed with heavy doses of mussels and beer and Franz Fritte. On the second day, we walked from Ypres to Langemark, the German war cemetery, just a few kilometers north of town. And we passed by the new Irish farm cemetery. It was a warm, sunny, late summer day. And even from afar, when we approached on the, on the road there, even from afar, we could hear the sounds of music wafting over the graves of that graveyard. And when we entered the cemetery, we saw a man with a bagpipe in the far end of the cemetery, and he was practicing. He was practicing his, his repertoire. And that was a very, very special moment. On that most beautiful, serene day in that very grave place, and so just as we arrived, there's this man who's playing all the right tunes for what we were talking about on that strange and beautiful instrument in an otherwise empty cemetery. And we started to talk to him, and he turned out to be the piper in the local band in Ypres, 
band of musicians, and he was practicing for their concerts and their occasional performances um, at the last post ceremony at, at Menin Gate. And so we explained to him our little mission, and then we asked him whether he'd be willing to play a tune for us while we were saying a prayer at the big cross that was towering above the, the scenery at the cemetery. And so there we were, five Germans, listening to a Flemish piper playing a Scottish tune on a bagpipe in an Irish Commonwealth cemetery located in the Plapéi of the Kingdom of the Belgians. That was a goosebumps moment. And it had a very rough, charming, and profound, and eminent beauty that uh, none of us will forget very quickly. So you can see from these two stories that I have a bit of a love affair with Ypres. And that only, even though I've only been there for maybe three times in my life, um, the place means something to me. <clears throat> and you will also understand that I was actually a bit speechless when I received the phone call, delighted and touched as well by uh, Thomas Baum of the, of, the, of the Peace Institute and was, and was asked by him whether I'd be willing to speak here tonight to you. And my answer was not yes, it was hell yes, I will speak. And so I'm here tonight and I'm profoundly thankful to whoever made this beautiful connection for me. Um, thank you very much for having me here tonight at the Flemish Parliament. It is a bit of a daunting task to hold a speech here, the 11th November Memorial Lecture, before such an eminent audience. We just heard the great names that have been here before, and that all of them have said smart things. I've read their speeches, and all of them had very thoughtful things to say about the legacy of the Great War and the meaning of what happened in the trenches on the Western Front, and the meaning of peace, obviously. I am not a historian and also not a writer, not a philosopher, not a politician and also not a diplomat. I'm a think tanker, a strange creature that is, a researcher who aims at understanding complex political situations so that he can explain them properly to whoever wants to listen. In an ideal world, a think tanker tries to give useful advice to those people in the policy community that actually make the decisions. So I'm not a practitioner of politics myself, but I'm eminently interested in the practicalities of politics and I'm not really interested in academic issues, but in practical politics. I'm an outsider pretending to be an insider. This is what a good friend of mine who's also in the think tank business said about the business that we're in, and I think it's, that's, that's to a certain extent right. So I will tackle the issue of peace in my own specific way here tonight. I'm a bit nervous about this myself, I will admit. And uh, even though I, he has assured me that he's not nervous, there must have been a little bit of nervousness on behalf of Thomas Baum when he asked me to speak here tonight. So peace. Peace, ladies and gentlemen, is not an end state like health. It is a continuous process. It is achieved through the permanent balancing of diverging interests. Again, every day, again and again. If it is to be successful, those trying to balance these interests need to know as much as they can about the ones that they're balancing with, about the other, and they need to understand where they come from. Peace is therefore balanced based on deep knowledge, backed up by strength, and it requires hard work. We just heard how long it took to get this parliament, and that it was not a big bang, but daily work every day by many people. And with peace, that's the same thing. Peace also takes the courage to take a leap of faith which means to give advanced trust to somebody when there's no guarantee that that might pay off, when you're actually taking a risk to foster peace. And it takes an understanding, as I said before, that this work will never ever end, that it all is episodical and only in the meantime. So peace can never be reached. It is there because it is achieved again and again, and that's a Sisyphus work, only that in this process, unlike Sisyphus, we don't have a can of Red Bull that gives us wings. And this is where Europe and the European integration process come into the picture, because obviously we must talk about this tonight. It would be very tempting and very easy to invoke the Nobel Peace Prize tonight and simply praise the European, for, the European Union for being such a big peace project. And the EU is that, of course. It is a big peace project. And I'm an unabashed supporter of the decision that the Nobel Prize Committee took this year in Oslo. But in our context tonight, 
What counts is that the EU is an almost ideal example of what I just described. Peace not as an end state, but as a process. Indeed, peace through process. But the EU is not, and this is where it gets a little complicated, it is not a peace process, like the one between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The EU was set up to guarantee peace in Europe by resolving first a couple, then a dozen, then a hundreds, and then much more, many more, real life, small and big problems that the nations of Europe have with each other on a daily basis. From trade barriers to border patrols, from consumer protection to health standards, from police cooperation to keeping farmers in business, from preventing business monopolies to establishing educational standards. Very concrete, very tedious, sometimes very boring things, sometimes very exciting things. The idea was to create peace by inventing a machinery, a process, into which all of these problems could be fed and resolved by applying commonly accepted rules. The idea was that while doing this, the machine would remove the causes of conflict, thereby producing peace, and it does. It does that actually quite well, even though the machine sputters often and makes funny noises at times, and it's not necessarily a very pretty machine to look at. But peace it does produce, peace by process. In contrast, the Middle East peace process does not produce any peace at all, because in reality it never was much of a process. No machinery, no commonly accepted rules, no real life problems solved, no peace. That's the difference, and it's an important difference. The peace process was meant to produce, and this is how it sometimes appears, to produce peace out of nowhere, but it doesn't work. And so the difference between process by peace and a peace process is quite important and actually essential. It is so important because this long-winded, tedious, bureaucratic, boring, abstract process that the EU is, and even the word process is such a plastic word that you actually don't want to use it much, that this process is so easy to dismiss and belittle and um, talk lowly about it. And we do that all the time. We think it costs too much. It's too far away from the people. It's opaque and aloof and somehow all kinds of bad things at the same time. And sometimes it is all of this. And we must, of course, work to make it better. But it works by and large. That's the miraculous thing. And it works, ladies and gentlemen, better than most of us think it does. The raison d'etre of the European integration project as peace through process is not an old-fashioned story of the past, as some people think today. How often do you hear this, that, ah, come on, don't tell me that peace story again. That's the old story. Tell me the new story. Even though people don't say story anymore these days, they say narrative. So what is the new narrative of the EU? Well, the new narrative is the old narrative. Europe is there for peace, period. Because our beautiful continent is still an endangered place. Look at some of the dark ghosts that have risen again in the European crisis. Europe has not lost any of its intrinsic instability. It has borrowed peace. War, genocide, jealousy, inflated nationalism, disregard for minorities, territorial disputes, racism, hatred, unhealthy feelings of inferiority and of superiority, mistrust, fear of the other, lack of compassion. All of this is still with us today in Europe. And it's not abstract. It's around the corner. It's everywhere. History has not ended in Europe. Europe is not static. It's changing. On top of all of this, the European nation building process, nation building in Europe, the forming of states, has also not come to an end, even though we think that the map that we know so well is, 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 is the final kind of settlement of all of this. It's not. Just look at the Balkans and Spain and Scotland and indeed Belgium. I'm not going to do my fellow Bavarian German friends the favor of also adding them to the list because their case is settled. But you can see it everywhere. All of this is still alive and ongoing as we are speaking, which is why we need the machine, the process, to create something dull and exciting to make, uh, and, and unexciting, something dull and unexciting to make all of this scary stuff just that, dull and unexciting. 
I have no doubts in my mind that the EU, as the machine that I have compared it to, has the power and the persistence to deal with the current crisis and to make dull and unexciting what seems to be existential. I'm confident because I think that people really want that in the end, and I'm confident that the machine actually has already produced quite a lot of good stuff. Look at all the drastic measures that were taken, sometimes within days, that were taken to prevent the crisis from boiling over. To be sure, it is not over, and now the contagion is spreading to France, and tough years and tough decisions are ahead of us, but in the end, I'm sure there will be a life after the crisis. What I'm not confident about is something else, and that is the main point that I want to make tonight. It is the point that occupies me at work every day, and it worries me and makes me nervous, not only because I fear for the future of Europe, but I will soon have a third child, three fabulous little girls, all of them European and all of them hungry for a stable and peaceful and free and affluent future. And the point that I'm worried about is this. For 60 years, the EU, the machine, that I described, created peace in Europe, but it focused mostly on producing peace inside Europe. It was an inward-looking project. Of course, this project always had its external dimensions, its trade policies and development aid, partnership programs, and even, of course, an enlargement process. But essentially, it was designed to pacify Europe at home because this is where the historical memory of war lies, and this is where instability and volatility led to 2,000 years of mayhem and murder. So the project was never too much concerned about also playing a decisive, forceful, and pacifying role outside Europe. It was focused on itself, not the world. And it could get away with this, ladies and gentlemen, because of two reasons. The first reason was that someone else was taking care of the outside world for us. That was, and still is, our close but distant cousin on the other side of that big blue sea, the United States, obviously. We outsourced our strategic engagement with the world to the Americans so that we could focus on pacifying ourselves. The second reason for this European naval gazing and why it was so successful and why we could actually get away with it is that until fairly recently, globalization was not really knocking on our door very heavily. Globalization had not, re has not, had not reached its final stages as it has now. We were less integrated with the world, less tied into a globally networked capitalism, less affected by things that were happening in faraway places like Korea or Venezuela or Kurdistan or Central Asia or the South China Sea. But these two excuses, the Americans taking care of it and the rest of the stuff happening far away, they don't exist any longer. What this means in tonight's context is that the machine must now also look outside Europe if it wants to keep the peace inside Europe. Europe's peace and wealth and freedom and stability is not maintained in Europe alone any longer. If we want to keep the peace in our world, here at home, but also embedded in a wider world where our cousin protector is weaker, and where everything is more closely connected, we ourselves must go global with our machine. Europe must become a more unified, stronger, more self-confident, more potent player in the world. That sounds counterintuitive in times of crisis, but it's the truth. Europe needs a foreign policy, a strategy to conduct it, the means to implement it, and the willingness to tackle the tricky issues. If it wants to keep peace through process, if it wants to keep that alive, it must conceive of a way to make itself a force for processing global problems. The problem is that at the very moment that these excuses are gone, and when Europe needs to build capacity to deal more and better with the outside world, Europeans are not in the mood to do this at all. They much rather continue focusing on things at home. And this is, of course, because of the crisis, but it would be too easy to just blame it on the crisis and say, well, that's a good excuse. In reality, the problem was already there before the crisis came, long before the crisis came over us. The real problem is not um, a lack of money or a lack of an attention span. The problem, in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, lies in a lack of ambition. Now, ambition is an ugly word today. 
It smacks of selfishness and bloated ego and greed and eagerness and elbows and brutality. It's very popular these days to dismiss ambition as a character flaw. But to look at ambition in only negative terms misses the point. Just look at the opposite. Complacency, laziness, passivity, sleepiness. Who wants that? So as we're having a bit of a fundamental discourse here tonight, let me define ambition also in a very fundamental way. Ambition, in my opinion, if you boil it down to its very essence, is the will to survive. Not the survival instinct that sets in at the moment of clear and present danger to your life, but in a wider sense, the aspiration to look at the world, to look at the facts, to acknowledge them, to look at the developments that are happening, <clears throat> and to do something about the, st the, the issues that are clearly coming our way. Let me repeat here an argument that I have made elsewhere before. When you actually look at the world as it is today and as it unfolds every day in our newspapers and on television and on the internet, <clears throat> what you see should very easily shake you out of your complacency, us Europeans, out of our foreign policy complacency. It is a picture of the Western post-Cold War status quo, the one that we found all very comfortable, coming apart. The list of worrisome items is endless. China is both assertive and in trouble. Our own demographics is alarming and we're all broke. Russia is in aggressive decline. Turkey is growing internationally but has severe problems at home. NATO is slowly turning into an empty shell. We have an increasingly hopeless situation in Afghanistan, and the Sahel itself is turning into the new Afghanistan. Germany is in denial about both its strength and its coming weakness. Britain is in recession and suffers from severe bouts of great power blues. France is struggling with even the mildest form of domestic reform. And the United States are stimmied by a suicidal loss of domestic political common sense. And that's just a short list. The Norwegian defense minister, Espen Bart Eide, made a chilling statement a few weeks ago when he said that regular military threats of the old kind, the good old stuff, they are back in Europe and that Article 5 of the NATO treaty has lost its credibility, he said, because European military assets have lost their deterrent power. And Julian Lindley French, a British historian and a longtime critic of Europe's complacency, says that all classic ingredients of substantial rivalry between nation states in Europe are back in place. It is clear then that European peace in the long run is threatened both from within and from the outside. For the inside, we have the machine. For the outside, we have very little. The key problem in all of this is the appalling lack of ambition Europeans portray in all areas of foreign and security policy. Europeans don't seem to want too much from the world or from their own role in it, more importantly. In their own debate, in the European debate, interests are permanently confused with values and if at last a real European interest is defined, nothing follows from it. No one really wants to shape the world anymore to make it a safer, better place that serves Europe's goals and those of our partners and friends and the ones that need our help. Nobody seems to be willing to really act decisively on the inside that a wealthy, democratic, values-oriented and export and trade-dependent continent is by default a global stakeholder in need of powerful foreign policy tools. Now, you can, of course, ask yourself what all of this has to do with Flanders Fields and with the 11th of November 1918, with peace and with Ypres. For me, the connection is very clear. You have to want peace hard enough. That's also an ambition. You have to have that ambition for peace. But the hunger for that peace cannot be separated any longer from the ambition to do something about the problems around the world. Korea. South Africa, Pakistan, Syria, Ukraine, Taiwan, the Arctic, Mali, Somalia, Kurdistan, and even some tiny islands in the South China Sea, they all concern us because if they go up in flames, we will feel it. 
We will feel it via disturbances of trade, terrorist threats, refugees, immigration, spiraling oil price, blocked sea routes, piracy, nuclear blackmail maybe, or simply by lost investments. So we can't afford to have no interest in this. We can't afford to say what the hell to all this, because when we say what the hell, what we will get is hell. In a recent panel discussion at Carnegie Europe, I asked all panelists what they thought was the biggest threat to European security in their opinion. All had great answers, but one struck me in particular, and that answer was the lack of European solidarity. At first sight, this sounded like a critical comment on Germany and its insistence on austerity, or on Britain and its ever-increasing demand for opt-outs out of the EU project, but it was meant in a different way. It was meant to say that by not working together more on EU foreign policy, Europeans portrayed a stunning lack of solidarity amongst themselves and for their own cause. Instead of doing what's good for all, they sacrifice common positions on the altar of very narrow interests and very abstract issues of sovereignty. Essentially, they betray themselves, is what my panelists said. Paradoxically, and not without irony, that means that they compromise each other's ability to stay alive in the long run by adhering to very narrow notions of survival. The lack of ambition, therefore, is also a lack of solidarity. And without solidarity, there will never be that new annex to the machine that expands the principle of peace by process to the international sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe needs an ambitious foreign policy. It needs this not to dominate or to colonize or to exploit or to subdue or to abuse. It needs it to survive. It needs to be a force for good in the world because few others want to be that and few others can. Europe will never be a superpower, but it can be a forceful player. But for that, it needs ambition. The ambition to exercise solidarity with itself by making a difference abroad. Europeans have all the tools they need for this. They have the institutions, the programs, even the money. And they even have the military means, in theory but they find very little ambition and solidarity to employ them and to bring them together in a concerted effort. This, ladies and gentlemen, must change because it's going to hurt us and it's going to disappoint those who actually count on our solidarity and on our responsibility. I will close my speech with one more Ypres story, only that this time it does not take place in Ypres but in France, in the Somme region that region that was the other part of the big slaughterhouse that was the Western Front about 100 years ago. In August of this year, my wife and I decided to spend the summer holidays in France in Picardie on the Bay de Somme and in Amiens. One of the reasons why we wanted to go there was to visit a small town called Villers Bretonneux, just outside Amiens. On the 4th of July, 1918, my grandfather, Fritz, and that is his real name, who was just 19 years old at the time, was wounded there in a battle between German and Australian soldiers, and he almost died. He was shot in the shoulder and in the face. He laid in the battlefield and was thought dead until a fellow German soldier found him and dragged him into safety. By the time my grandfather had regained his consciousness, the man who had saved him was dead himself. I had looked up the exact location where all this had happened based on some of the surviving documents of my father, grandfather's time in the war, and it was to my surprise not difficult at all to find the location of the battle. All of that is very well documented on the internet, and the Australians do a marvelous job of making that accessible. We saw the fields where it all happened, where the bullet hit my grandfather's shoulder instead of his heart, where a few centimeters decided whether he would live and where the same few centimeters ultimately decided whether I would ever live. I am very thankful to this one Australian soldier, may God bless him, that he was such a bad shot that day. It was a very moving experience to stand there <clears throat> in those fields. We had brought our children along, and the two girls are two and a half and five years old. 
And then we visited the Australian monument near my grandfather's battlefield, an impressive, very large white monument um, overlooking the fields of Picardy. And I found many gravestones near that monument, which bore the date of the 4th of July of 1918. These people had died the day my grandfather lived. And maybe even the man who wounded him is buried in that Australian graveyard. Maybe some of those that were killed by Fritz Techau are buried there. I will never know. So while me and my wife looked and read and walked, our two daughters played between the gravestones. They were running and laughing and yelling, and I took pictures of them, the girls between the white stones. It was a very crass, beautiful, terrible contrast. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a contrast out of which ambition grows. My wife is Dutch. She's very pregnant, and this is the reason why she's not here with me tonight. She asked me to apologize to all of you and extend her profound regrets that she can't make it tonight. If God wills it, a third Dutch-German little girl will be born in early December. She will be born in Flanders, in Leuven, not far from Sterrebeek, where we live. As soon, as soon as she is sturdy enough to be packed into a car and driven out, I'll bring her to Ypres, to Flanders Fields. She will not know why, not for a long time. Maybe not even I myself will know exactly why. But there's one thing that I know precisely, and that is that in Flanders Fields lies, lies the reason why I should be ambitious for her. Thank you very much, and God bless you.